This is a presentation from Winchester Academy. Um, well, thank you for the introduction, and, and thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I, I appreciate it. It's a gorgeous night outside, and I would be out doing something, but, uh, but I'm not. So, uh, Well, um, so I'm going to talk about rock art and, uh, uh, and, and rock art in the Driftless area. So, that's, uh, so I'll explain what the Driftless area is. I'll give you a little introduction to what rock art is. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the book Hidden Thunder, uh, which was published in 2016 by the Wisconsin Historical Society, and give you some examples of some of the rock art sites that are discussed in that book. I think I'm going to talk about four of them tonight, and just walk you through uh, some of those sites as examples of rock art right here in Wisconsin. So uh, that's the book tonight. All right, so uh, here we go. Okay, so rock art. When most people think of rock art, they're probably thinking about, or they're probably familiar with, some of the, the paintings from some of the caves in France and Spain, the Paleolithic rock art from La Skull Cave or Chauvet Cave. These things are 35,000 years old, painted by our ancestors over in Europe uh, that, at that time. But there's rock art throughout the world. So in the desert southwest, many of you have maybe traveled out to the, the dry area where you can see lots of rock and you can, you, can just, you can see the rock art much better than here. Coccapelli, the very famous flute player from the rock art in the southwest, um, and there's thousands of rock art sites throughout the desert southwest. Um, in Australia, there's rock art. So these are the, the famous, uh, the aboriginal, these skeletonized humans and animals that they have in their dream world that they, that they depict in their rock art. Um, and in Ireland, some of the Gaelic or Celtic art uh, you, 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 you can see. Um, the point being that anywhere in the world that there have been people and rocks, there's rock art. Okay? The only place there's not rock art is, Aust is, is Australia, is uh, Antarctica. Okay? Because there just hasn't been rock and people there long enough to do that. Um, and, and there's rock art here in Wisconsin, and many people don't, you know, haven't been familiar with this until fairly recently, but um, uh, here's the dripless area that I'm going to focus on tonight. But there's rock art up in the boundary waters in northern Minnesota. If, you, if you've canoed or kayaked up in that area, there's lots of rock explosion. There's lots of paintings of canoes and moose and people and animals. In southwestern Minnesota, there's carvings on some of the red rock at Jeffers Petroglyph site, which is a state site in Minnesota, um, and at Pipestone National and a monument where Native Americans quarried pipes, the red, this red stone to make pipes. Uh, there's some glyphs there as well. Um, uh, in Door County, the tip of Door County at Gills Rock, if you've been up that way, there's some paintings on the rock up there. Uh, it's hard to see, but there's a moose and some canoes at Death Store or Portimore up there uh, depicted on those rocks. Um, and then down uh, in southern Illinois and Missouri, there's, there's, a, there's some paintings and carvings down in that area as well. So all around Wisconsin, uh, there's rock art, where there's rock. Glaciated northern Wisconsin, glaciated eastern Wisconsin, not much rock, not much rock art. Most, most of Minnesota glaciated, except other than the boundary waters in the southwest part, there's not much rock art in Minnesota, except along the Mississippi River in the Driftless area. So the Driftless area, I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Different kinds of rock art, okay, so I'm going to use some terms. Petroglyphs are carvings. 20% of the rock art that we know of is things we can recognize. People and deer and buffalo and birds and things like that. 80% of the rock art in the world and in the Driftless area is abstract designs. Ge geometric forms, grids and circles and spirals and things like that that we don't really know what they mean. 80% of the rock art is abstract, okay? Petroglyphs are carvings. Pictographs are paintings. Same thing. You get a bird with a hand stuck to its arm. Some combination of a bird and human there. Uh, this is a painting in the famous Gottschall Rock Shelter in the southwestern part of the state. Uh, there's a human with a head and his arm coming off and tattooed body there. Um, but most of the, pictog the, the pictographs are also abstract designs. Don't know what they mean. Sometimes, once in a while, we get a wall that tells a story. We call these compositions. So this is a rock shelter in Richland County called Indian Cave, and there's a line of carvings on this wall, petroglyphs, and this is a drawing of what that is, and it tells a story. And in fact, it's a, it's a story of somebody telling a story. So here's a human sitting down, talking to this other person's sitting down, and he's telling him a story, and there's a dog-like animal behind him, and here's a human standing up with a bow that's heading towards this deer-like animal over there. So it's almost as if this person is telling a story about a deer hunt, a successful deer hunt. 
So sometimes you can read the art. Pretty rare, we call those compositions. And then one of the problems with rock art is, that, is, is that I should have said at the beginning, but is that it's really hard to date. One of the problems with rock art is it's hard to know how old it is. Portable rock art objects are things that we find on village sites and campsites. Things like pipes and tablets and sandstone objects. And when we find these things on village sites, we can date them because we you can get radiocarbon dates from the, the, the fire hearths and things like that where these things are found and you can get a radiocarbon date and you know how old those are. And then when those dates, you can apply the styles like this forked eye face of a human to sometimes you see those on rock art walls as well. So you can apply the date from this, which is about 700 years old. If you see that on a rock art wall, you know that's about 700 years old as well. Okay? Um, so portable rock art's really important to try to get the age of things. I should have said also that when I started doing archaeology, a long time ago now, um, I was very happy excavating Oneota village sites in La Crosse and finding pottery. I became kind of a, a ceramic analysis specialist and doing stone tools and things like that. And, and, and I had no interest at all in rock art because of the two problems. One, you don't know how old it is and, because you can't date the rock. You can't radiocarbon date rock. It has to be an organic piece of material, charcoal, things like that, bone. Um, the other problem with rock art is understanding its meaning. Okay? You can't, it's really hard to interpret rock art. Okay? So I wanted nothing to do with it. But I became an archaeologist in western Wisconsin in the Driftless area. and. There's lots of rock art in the Driftless area, so I was drawn into it and ultimately got sucked into it to the point where I became hooked on it, so addicted to it. So this is Driftless area rock formations. Driftless area has sandstone and limestone, alternating layers of these. The sandstone was laid down about 500 million years ago during the Cambrian Age. The limestone on top about 400 million years ago during the Ordovician period. Um, and most of the rock art is in the sandstone. We're going to find very little rock art in the limestone formations. There's lots of caves, like Cave of the Mounts, in limestone, but there's no rock art in those, rock, in those limestone caves. Sandstone pillars that just stick out of the landscape, small overhangs, rock shelters that people lived in for the winter time, have carvings on them, just crevices that you have to sort of work your way through, sometimes just covered with carvings. Um, and then once in a while, just recently, in the past 20 years, we found these deep sandstone caves. There's two of them that are known now. They go in for hundreds of feet, and there's rock art in those. So I'm going to talk about one of those tonight called Tainter Cave. So this is the book, Hidden Thunder, that I'm going to focus on tonight. Um, and and the, the, how this book came about is that Jerry Schraub, and this is her husband, Bob, Jerry Schraub, for her career, she was a court reporter. So she would sit in court and hear the worst stories of people that our society has to offer. And as a court reporter, she had to sit there like a statue and record those stories and not show any emotion. She couldn't say a word, she couldn't gasp, she couldn't show any emotion. She had to sit there and record those events. And it was driving her crazy. She'd come home and it just, it, it just wore on her. So one day, just for relief, she was not a trained artist at all, she just took some watercolors and made a handprint. And that just offered her relief. And so she started to paint as just a hobby. And then about a couple of years later, she got interested in Native American rock art. And she started to visit sites, take pictures, and go home and do watercolors of those sites. And then we met at a conference, a rock art conference, where she was selling some of her art or showing some of her art. And we started visiting sites together. And it was really interesting because I had an, she's, she's German white, but it was an artistic perspective that as an archaeologist, I'm, I'm scientist, you know, I'm sort of like this block of science that. I can't think humanist, humanistically very well. Um, but she could do that. And so we, like, we sort of like shared these ideas at these sites, and it was kind of fun. And then we got a Native American friend, Cloris Lowe, a Ho-Chunk um, friend of ours, and we started visiting sites together. And then we started giving talks together. Um, and it was really intriguing, because now we had a Native American perspective, an artist perspective, and, a, and an archaeological perspective. Um, and Jerry said, we should write a book. And I said, no. But she said, yes. And so we did. Um, <laughs> Because writing books is not fun. Well, it can be, but it's, it's a hard work. It took five years to do this book. Well, Cloris wasn't able to, to finish the book with us, but so it ended up with just being Jerry and I. But how this book works is that we took 12 sites 
in the Driftless area and two in southwestern Minnesota, Jeffers and, and, and Pipestone. And each chapter is, is a site. And I do a geology, archaeology description of that site. And then Jerry does an artistic perspective of it. And then in between each chapter, we invited Native American voices. So there's, we, we had, we, all over Wisconsin, tribes, uh, people representing various tribes. You know, anything you want to say about, you know, that, that might tie into this book. So we have poems and stories and just reflections and all sorts of things. And there are just these Native American voices interspersed with the book. And it's just kind of a fun thing to do. Um, so that's the book. So here's some sites. This is... Uh, this is the Driftless area. All the sites, these are, these are the sites that we did in the Driftless area. Glaciated Eastern Wisconsin, Northern Wisconsin, very little rock art. Uh, these is Jeffers and, and, uh, and, and uh, Pipestone over through there. So I'm going to do four of these sites tonight. The first one is Samuel's Cave. And I'm going to start with Samuel's Cave because this is one of the oldest known rock art sites in Wisconsin. It was first discovered in 1878 on the Samuel's Farm. Frank Samuels was a teenage boy, and he was out raccoon hunting um, with his dog. And, and they came through this canyon-like valley, um, and the dog crawled into a little overhang and disappeared. And, and Frank looked in, and, and, and it went in a ways. And so he went back and got a lantern with some of his buddies, 1878. And they took these lanterns back, and sure enough, this thing opened up into a cave. And they saw on the walls of the cave some carvings. Um, and this is pretty near La Crosse. So word got back to La Crosse through word of mouth, and then a local antiquarian came out and visited the site, and he made some drawings of them, and these are some of his drawings of the things you see there. Buffalo, a couple of buffalo, a human here, standing bird, uh, there's a bow hunter up there, there's an elk or a deer with an antler, antlers on it. Um, and then, uh, the, the, by 1879, they contacted the State Historical Society, Now, archaeology wasn't a profession then, but the State Historical Society sent somebody to excavate this cave. And they excavated under the floor of Samuel's cave, and this is a picture of the, from the front of it now, when they opened it up, um, and they found four layers of occupation. So a layer with pottery and stone tools, and then a layer of pure sand, and a layer of charcoal and bone and things like that, and then a layer of pure sand. Four layers of Native American occupation going back in time. And they excavated those, and those artifacts are pretty much mostly gone now, but they described some of the pottery as being tempered with crushed shell. And we now know that represents the Oneyota culture, which is about 700 years old, the last pre-contact pre culture in western Wisconsin. They also made rubbings. So these are preserved at the State Historic Society. They took tissue paper and rubbed on the walls. So here's, here's basically this elk right through there, or deer. Um, some of the artifacts went to the Peabody Museum at Harvard University. So here's a fragment of pottery from Picture Cave, is what it was called originally near West Salem, Wisconsin, by E.B. Usher, who was a judge in La Crosse Center. This is that piece of pottery that's still in those collections. We now recognize it as being a type of pottery called Alamakee Trail, and this is what an Alamakee Trail pot looks like when it's reconstructed. This is an Oneota vessel, dates about five to seven hundred years old. It has these dots in it, and those are, you can see some of those big dots right there. So that's a, that's a classic type of pottery that we now recognize as about seven hundred years old. So one of those layers of occupation was about 700 years old, Oneota. And the buffalo carved in there are probably Oneota carvings because the Oneota were hunting buffalo. No one else was. Milwaukee Public Museum came to Samuel's Cave in the 1920s. This is Will McCurran. He was a famous archaeologist uh, at that time. And they took the first photographs of some of the glyphs, and they put chalk in them. So here's a bear-like animal, or maybe a buffalo, too. Here's a long-tailed animal with claws on it. Uh, these are some of the Milwaukee Public Museum photographs. I went there for the first time in 1986. Now, by this time, this cave was a party cave. There were beer cans and soda cans and trash everywhere. Um, and, and, and there's graffiti all over the walls. And, and it had started to exfoliate it because the, the walls started to peel away, break away, because freeze-thaw breaks up the sandstone. And when they opened up this, the, the cave in 1879, when they excavated it, it allowed freezing and thawing of the walls for the first time in hundreds of years. So by, when I got there, it was like many of the, a lot of the walls were broken away. There's graffiti everywhere. But we looked really carefully, and you could see some glyphs. Like here's that human with a headdress that was drawn in 1878. He's still there. And then we looked a little further back in the cave, towards the rear of the cave, and we saw 
pictographs for the first time recorded in Samuel's cave. There were carvings, no, but nobody saw these drawings. So here's a charcoal drawing of a human. There's a head, the arms coming out, has kind of a dress-like thing, and actually like, has almost like turtle-like feet. It's very weird. Here's a buffalo. There's a snout, the horns are right there. Comes back, the, the, the hump is showed as a series of slashes. There's a circular thing like a sun or moon above it. Um, and then this is a carving actually up of, of there. There's two more things right through here. This is what that looks like when you draw it out. There's the human, we call him the bubble man because somebody carved bubble over his belly. Uh, there's the buffalo. And interestingly, the buffalo has a petroglyph, that long-tailed lizard that Wilma Kern photographed, carved over the top of it. And that's right here. You can kind of see it right through here. So that's superimposed. So the buffalo was there first, and then they carved that long-tailed animal over the top of it. Pick the grass, pretty rare in Wisconsin. The vast majority of art are carvings. About 20% of the rock art is pictographs or paintings, at least now. A lot of it may have been pictographs, but it's just eroded away. About that time, there was a Gotchel rock shelter that was being excavated by Bob Salzer at Beloit College, which is a pictograph site and became kind of famous. So when this was found, pictographs were kind of a hot topic, and it was a, it was a, a very important thing. So we got a grant to try to document this site. Again, we brought in, this is Yanni Laubser. He's a South African specialist in documenting rock art, came to Samuel's cave and he just photographed everything and he wrote a very detailed report of the condition of the thing. And that was kind of Samuel's cave. And then to preserve it, we, we, we built a gate over the wall over the front of it. The, land, the landowner, the current landowner is a carpenter. So he built this gate and he scribed it to the top of the ceiling and, and, and such. Um, and, and we insulated the walls to try to keep it from freezing and thawing. And within about three years, somebody broke into it. They just busted down the doors. And this was, yeah, so it's just, you can't, it's, it's not visible from their house. It's up and over a ridge. It's kind of isolated. So protecting rock art is, is, is one of the big problems we have. Um, so this is that, here's the guy with the headdress. And this is Jerry Schraub's painting of him. And she calls it healing. This is one of her first rock art paintings. And remember the story that she's a, she was a court reporter. And she, this just helped her feel better. But she talks about healing in that shelter in terms of, because this reminded her of, this vandalism reminded her of some of the crimes she was heard about as a court reporter. So this is like her, her in her mind, her artistic mind, you know, the healing process and that, that should happen in that cave. So that's Samuel's cave. Tainter Cave is a newly discovered cave. This is one of those deep sandstone caves. First visited in 1999, um, it was actually, I, I, at La Crosse, I was at UW La Crosse, and I was the regional archaeologist at the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center. And people would report things to me as a regional archaeologist, so I got site tips all the time. And in 1993, I got a letter from a guy named Daniel Arnold. And he said, hey, I was just in a cave down by Soldier's Grove. And, and it's a deep cave, and it has stuff on it. It has paintings all over the wall. And then, and then on the floor, there's like Birch Park, Birch Park torches. And, and I was like, 1993, I was like, these don't exist in Wisconsin. We don't find deep caves with pictographs all over them and such. So I ignored it. I just put it in a file. And then about 1999, I had a project in that area. So I pulled, I just happened across that tip file again, decided to go visit it. And sure enough, this is Tainter Cave, and it's full of stuff. So I'll show you. Um, this is the opening. It's about three feet tall, about 20 feet across. You have to crawl on your hands and knees. No idea that this thing is going to go back 300 feet, open up into three contiguous rooms. At the entrance, there are carvings. There's a diamond and a dot. That's a pretty classic Native American motif we call a vulva form. Um, and then there's graffiti all over the place. As you go into it, uh, this passageway leads back. So there's a first room, a big arching room about the size of this room. There's a narrow passageway that opens up to a long, narrow hallway, goes back about another 80 feet or so. And then it opens up in a big dome-shaped room again. By the time you get back to the back of the first room, um, it's pitch dark. You need a flashlight. And, and the art goes way beyond that. So to, to make the art, the Native Americans had to have torches. And sure enough, Daniel Arnold was right. There's birch bark torches laying on the ground in the rocks at Samuel, just laying on the surface in that cave. So birch bark torch, you roll up birch bark, it'll burn for a long time like a candle. And, and, and we found that the sole of a hide moccasin. Now, in Wisconsin, we don't find perishables like this very often. We have freeze, thaw, wet, dry. So in, in archaeological world, these things just disintegrate. 
But in a cave that's constant temperature, constant humidity, they'll preserve. It's not a dry cave like the Southwest. But in this cave, we found the sole of a hide moccasin. That's pretty rare for Wisconsin. So the, the cave, by, just by the torches and, and the, the moccasin, is pretty important. But then there's the rock art. So these are some of the glyphs, pictographs, mostly, in Samuel's Cave. Again, we have realistic ones. Here's a series of two deer that are running. Uh, here's an, here's a, uh, an animal that has an antler on it. So it's a, it's a, it, I thought it was a caribou initially, but it's, a, it's, an, it's an elk or a deer. And there's a human sort of riding above it. Um, and then here's a buffalo-like animal down here. This is the first directly dated rock art site in Wisconsin. Remember, carbon-14, you need organic matter. This is drawn with charcoal, a charred stick. So it's organic. We picked away a tiny, tiny bit of that organic matter, and radiocarbon dating, now you can do a five milligrams to get a date. You used to have, you used to have 10 grams, you had a handful of charcoal to get a date. Now you can get a pick, you can pick a little bit off. So that was dated to 700 AD. That's the time when people were building effigy mounts in southwestern Wisconsin. So it's the first direct, and still the only directly dated rock art site in Wisconsin. Most of the art, again, is abstract. You got these grids and things, and here's this, a box that has a spike driven through with two triangles in it. Anybody knows what that means? I'll buy you a, I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, there's just these things, right? And then this is the back of the first wall. Okay, this is right where you have to have a flashlight to see this, but it's covered with rock art. Okay, on the top is an abstract bird. It's just a triangle with wings. It's a bird, and it's on top. On the bottom is a lizard-like animal. This is way down, it's off this slide. Okay? And in between, in the middle, is a human. So this wall represents upper world bird, lower world long-tailed animals, like that one in Samuel's Cave, and panther mounds and turtle mounds throughout this region are underworld spirits, water spirits. They're bad for people. They'll tip over your moccasin if you don't put water, if you don't put tobacco in the water. Okay, these are bad guys. These are good guys. The birds, the thunderbirds protect us. And in the middle are people and deer and things like that. So there's this upper world, lower world, and earth world in the middle. Their cosmos is depicted on this wall. Here's that human, no head. It's a headless human. Coming out of where the head should be are zigzag lines. Those are like lightning bolts or power lines, power speech lines. So that's a pretty important person. Usually when the arms are up on people, they, they're referred to as shamans. These are medicine people. It's kind of a universal interpretation of those. This is, oops, sorry. This is Jerry's painting of this guy right here. In the back room, way in the back room on the ceiling, is this little guy. And I saw this guy with bent, the arms turned down. I said, oh, that's, it's a, that's a bird man. It's a combination of human and bird. Jerry saw this as a birthing scene, because she's a woman. I've never had a baby. She did. She said, this is a woman bearing down, and sure enough, coming out of the, the, that central part, is there something coming out of there? So she calls this birthing. That's her painting of it. That's what helps when you, you know, open your mind. All right, so at the front of the cave, just inside the entrance, if you, if you go in and look up, you see this. Um, these, these things connect. Um, there's this thing here, which is, uh, there's a circle and a box that has whole lines going across another circle on the chest area, and this line goes across, that actual line cont continues here, and there's a bird, there's a speckled body, a tail, and a wing, the other part is exfoliated off, it's gone. This is a drawing of it. So you have this thing here, it's a head with a, it, you know, in a box-like thing with a braided hair coming off, the line going this way, and there's that bird, a speckled bird, okay? Um, I didn't know what that was initially, but I have a colleague, Jim Thieler, who said, that looks like a, a cradle board. And this is George Catlin's 1833 cradle drawing of a cradle board of a mandan, but Ho-Chunk, Menominee, all the tribes in this area had cradle boards as well. Um, and you can see the circle on top, the horizontal lines, and then dangling from the front of the cradle board, the bar that keeps them from hurting themselves if it tips over, is a little sack. And that sack had the dried umbilical cord button of the baby. And Catlin wanted to buy the cradle board to take back to his museum. And the, the man Dan women said, okay, I'll sell you that, but you're not getting this. Because that, that button, the umbilical cord button, is power. That's the health of my baby. So he couldn't get that part of it. This may be 
that same sort of thing. A cradle board with that, that circle and a chest might be that same sort of thing. And then again, this is Jerry's drawing or painting of that, of that scene. Okay? I guess my wife and son just walked in. Um, so this is uh, the, the middle room in Tainter Cave. And, and on, this, on this wall, there's a horizontal line. And there's glyphs above and glyphs below. This is a drawing of it. The glyphs above are all sky scenes. They're birds and feathers and bird feet. OK, there's a feather, there's a, a wing, there's a feather, uh, bird feet, and, and there's an abstract. These are abstract birds up here. You have the horizontal line. Below the horizontal line is a deer hunting scene. OK, bow hunters, there's, a, there's nine bow hunters and a whole bunch of deer. Three of the deer have baby beer, deers in their bellies, so they're, they're pregnant does. The deer get pregnant in the rut in November. They drop their does in May. So this is a winter scene. These are pregnant does. Winter is the, the season of starvation. This is January, February, March. There's no food on the landscape except deer. And so this may be telling the story of a successful hunt. Here's a bow hunting shooting at this deer with the... the the, the fetal deer inside, okay? But again, it's upper world, earth world in this case, but a successful deer hunting story. So we protected Tainter Cave by building a gate. Um, and this, we, we hired a, a cave conservationist to come in. We, ha we hauled steel beams up to this thing and had a welder cut them into, you know, weld them into place, cut them and weld them into place. Um, and so this is designed so that air flows Bats can go in and out. People can't. So it protects that cave, that art, uh, because again, the first time we went in, there was beer cans and things like that. It's two miles from the nearest high school. So. <laughs> All right, uh, Gullickson's Glen. I got two more sites to show you. Gullickson's Glen uh, is this beautiful sandstone rock shelter in a little stream in Jackson County. Um, a stream running through here. Uh, just to show you Jerry's paintings of some of the glyphs at the beginning, because I'm going to focus on the art. I show Gullickson's because we just finished yesterday a 500-page report about this site. So I'm kind of familiar with it. It's kind of on, on my brain right now. Um, so Gullickson's was first photographed in 1932. These are some black and white photographs from that time period. It was actually first recorded in 1917, World War I era. Uh, some letters were exchanged and drawings. But this is the first photographs. And this is the left side. And you can see a, 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 a deer or elk-like animal up on top that has an antler rack. There's another one right through here, another antler rack. So those are bucks, deer or elk, can't tell. There's a little baby one right here, the head and the body, tail going up. There's a long-tailed underworld Animal right here, the head and the tail coming down, the legs coming down. Um, and then on the other side, there's this classic deer or elk head. Uh, and then on that side also, there's this canine-like animal, fox or something like that. And it's got something in its mouth. It's killed a bird or something like that. It's carrying in its mouth. Okay? Um, 1933, Charles Brown, Charlie Brown, was a state archaeologist in Wisconsin for many, many years. He was really good. Um, he went to Gullickson's Glen, and he... Uh, he drew some of the glyphs, but he also mapped it and did some excavation. So this is the front of the cave. This is the actual middle, the, the dark areas that should, where you can go inside. The other part is sort of the arch on top. Um, and then the red area is a map of the floor where he excavated. So he excavated a part of the floor in 1933, and, and then he drew some things. He also made casts of six of the glyphs. And he did that by covering the wall with lard where the glyph was, and building a clay kind of rim around it, and then taking plaster of Paris with wood shavings to in there, and then they hardened up, and he peeled it away, and he took them back to the state of Stoke, said, and they were on exhibit there. This is 1945, 15 years later almost. They were on exhibit that the state of Stoke said, so here's that, that big, this, there's this guy right here. Okay? There's a turkey. There's the canine behind there. There's two humans up through here. Um, so, so they cast those things. 1950s, Gullickson's Glen, the local historical society, Jackson County Historical Society, got the, they were given the site to, to turn it into a park from the Gullickson family. And they had a big dedication on June 8, 1956, and this is a photograph of the dedication. There's actually about 400 people out here that you can't see. But inside, there's about 20 speakers, including Ho-Chunk representatives. Uh, and, uh, and, they, and they made this dedication where they turned the land over, started the park. Uh, there was an archaeologist at that time named Warren Witchery. 
This is where Wittry pointed to some of the glyphs. Um, and Wittry came back and excavated that site that fall, that August, about a month later. He hired uh, about five Ho-Chunk workers from Black River Falls to work with us. These are Ho-Chunk diggers uh, working with Wittry. And he then what he did is he also made rubbings of the glyphs. So this is Wittry and his assistant Jim Porter. Uh, and they have a, a, one of those, they've got one of those deer or elk, uh, and it's on the wall up there, but that's a rubbing of it right there. They did ink roll rubbings. Those rubbings still preserve. They're still at the State Historic Site. And they're actual to scale, so they're perfect. Which are used those rubbings to make the first detailed and most accurate drawing of the, the rock art at Gullickson's Glen. So this is that central area that Brown showed as a dark area on the inside. It's a flat back wall. It's a joint plate. And it's got all sorts of stuff on it. It's kind of confusing, but there's a fish coming right through here. There's the mouth and the eye, and it's got fins up through here and a split tail there. There's another fish this way that has like canine teeth, and it's, it's fin, the back fins are right are in this area. In the upper fin, it's carved out. It's actually a canoe, becomes a canoe, and there's two humans standing in that canoe. Uh, there's another human over here, another human over there. Which was the first guy to see a buffalo, a nursing calf, and a buffalo, and that buffalo is an arrow going in the heart, in the, in the, the, from the mouth to the chest. It's called a heart line. Uh, and buffalo, again, are probably Oneota in this region. So that's just a complex of stuff on the back wall. Um, but on the left side, here's those antlered bucks, one, two, three of them. Uh, and this is a stack of geese with their, their necks bent over, uh, the little baby one there, and a human up here as well. And on the right side, there's the classic, used to be called a deer, but it's got a beard. Okay, these slash lines down the neck, that's a beard, and, and deer don't have beards, elk do. So just by putting those slash lines on, we know that's an elk. Not a deer. There's a thunderbird down below. There's that canine holding that probably dead bird, a human with really big hands, and then a turkey uh, that was cast as well. And that's, a, so that's the most complete record we have of Gullickson's Glen. 1989, the left side where those antlered bucks were collapsed. And the archaeologist, this is Cindy Stiles Hansen from uh, at Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center, where I was at, uh, collecting remains of some of the glyphs that had fallen down. So this is the back wall, and this is a fresh collapse. And people have already carved their names in it. They're collecting samples. She actually used Wittry's map to show ones that she was able to, to, to find. And these are some of the things that are still preserved at MVAC uh, as, as, as rock art samples that she recovered. And there's that little deer uh, right there. You can still sort of, there's the head and the body coming down sort of thing. So it was, it was a problem uh, that na nature erodes rock art. People add graffiti, nature erodes rock art. The DNR obtained the site in the mid-1970s, and after the collapse, they built a chain-link fence across the front of it. Uh, it's a state natural area uh, to keep people out from, from getting out. Of course, you know, climbing over a chain-link uh, chain fence, if you really want to get in there, is not too hard. And this gap here is about wide enough for a pe person to get through. So the fence wasn't very successful. And the other thing it did is it kind of made the rock art look like a zoo scene. Right? So here's that classic signature elk head behind the zoo cave. They took the fence down in 2010. Um, and Jerry and I then went there in 2012 and, and documented it for our book. This is the canine through time, just to show you what happens. 1932, 1958, when Witch was there, it's still there. Uh, 2009, Exfoliation, the rock starts to peel away, goes right up to the bottom of the canine. By 2012, the bottom legs are gone, and last fall, it's all it's all the way up to where you know it's the back tail starting to go too. This thing's going to be gone in a few years, so it's 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 just eroding. And you know, so what can we do to try to preserve it is is one of the questions that we're trying to trying to deal with. Also, 2021, somebody's still carving their names in there. So people are still going and carving their names. So we got a grant from the DNR to go, because who owns it, to go back this spring and redocument the current condition of Gullickson's Glen. And what we did for the first time was we used portable LIDAR. So an iPhone, if you have an iPhone 13, you can actually scan this room and get a 3D image of it. Architect, people use it for architecture all the time and interior design. You can do that on a rock art site as well. So we scanned the Gullickson's Grock, Glen Rock Art Rock Shelter to get a 3D image of it, hoping that we could actually bring out some of the glyphs a little better. It didn't work that well. But what we did notice is we, we could document do by doing this is that this is Witchery's original drawing of the interior. 
This is the area that's collapsed. The blue, that's where those antlered bucks are. So this shelter has almost doubled in size from the collapsing going on. Um, and that's just a natural process that's going on. This is the current condition of the turkey. Uh, there's a thunderbird and a human, that human with the big hands. You can just see how they're just eroding away. The surface is just deteriorating. And then this is the elk head uh, as of today. There's actually a, another deer carved over the top of it. There's the head and the neck coming down. This is his back and the tail and the belly coming over through there. And there's a little abstract buffalo right here. The horns are right through there too. Um, but it's, you know, this has been collapsed for a long time, but this is starting to erode as well. So Gullickson's is a problem. All right, last site I'm going to show you and wrap this up is, is Rosha Cree State Park. And I always wrap up with Rosha Cree because this is the only publicly accessible rock art site in Wisconsin. If you want to see rock art, go to Rosha Cree State Park. It's not far from here. Adam's Friendship. Um, and and it, Rosha Cree is in the middle of Glacial Lake, Wisconsin, the old flat sand bed where they grow potatoes today. Uh, it's a 300-foot sandstone pillar that juts out from that uh, that, uh, that bed, um, and, and it stands out like a sore thumb. You can see it from miles and miles away. At the south end of it, uh, there's a sheer sandstone cliff, and at the base of that cliff, it's all full of carvings right through here. Uh, so I'll point out some of the carvings, and the DNR has added interpretive panels here, so if you go there, you can actually see some of the things. All right? um, Gullickson's was first reported, the rock art that was first mentioned, uh, 1851, when the government land, over, land office surveyors came across and they were laying out the township range and section system to sell the land after the, the treaties with the Native Americans, the land secessions. Um, and this is the, this is the, the geolo uh, surveyor record. He says, um, on, at, on, Gullicks, on, on Gullickson's, on Rosha Cree, um, there are, on its sides, there are hieroglyphs of antiquated appearance, and they, they found anywhere to extent of 10 to 100 square feet. Um, and the, these would be, these would afford interesting occupation to the antiquarian, and certainly, certainly worthy of a detailed investigation. That's 1851. Well, the first detailed investigation was 1989. Okay, so it took us a while to get there. Um, so this is, uh, this is the, the, the main panel on that south wall. And there's, there's just, there's all sorts of, there's turkey tracks, and there's canoes, and there's just all sorts of abstract things. And these are Jerry's paintings of some of that there, okay? Now, when it was first documented, um, it was what was known as petroglyphs, the carvings, okay? I went there in, in about 87, and, and just happened to be there on a day when the, the overcast skies were such that, you, I, looking up to this graffiti JSF, we noticed red pigment. And so we saw pictographs for the first time. And this is what those are. This is a, this is a technique called de-stretch, where you can take a digital photograph and enhance the colors and bring it out. So what you see here is a human with a zigzag line coming out connected to a thunderbird, and then another human without a head back here. All right? So that's telling a story. That's a composition. I can tell you what that is maybe in a little bit for a quarter. So these stretch also in the lower part of that rock art panel, there's a very faint red figure, red, red figure. these stretch brings it out. It's another human bird-like animal or figure that comes out and there's a zigzag line like a lightning bolt coming out of its head too. So there's more pictographs at Rosha Creek than we knew about before. Um, this is the, the pictograph panel. This is Jerry's painting of the Thunderbird connected to the human with that zigzag line uh, there as well. Okay? So, Rosha Cree, again, the, most, the only publicly accessible site in Wisconsin that you can go visit. It's got this interpretive panel. You can go and see things. It's real nice. This was, this was built around 2000 or so. They, they, the DNR constructed this after the documentation. And, and within a few years, somebody went there with spray paint and sprayed it right over the front of it. And so it became a problem. The DNR is like, what do we do? Do we shut down this rock art site? And what they ended up doing is to hire a rock art conservator and paid her lots of money to come here. There's only two in the, in the country. And she was able to remove most of the, the paint. Um, and so you can, you can still see shadows of it if you go there today. But, um, but it's a problem. Rock art is not, it's hard to preserve. It's hard to, so we document it and we try to keep it secret. But you can go see this one. Okay, all right. So that's that's the the 
main po that's the end of the talk, I guess. So uh, I'd be happy to talk to answer questions. Uh, we do have Danielle. You, you, did you bring more? Down? So she brought extra books. We have Hidden Thunder here. Uh, these are some of the other books that we also have written and have for sale if you're interested at all. But I'm happy to entertain questions if you want. Then that whirlwind tool of, oh, tour of Wisconsin. Well, let's Rocket. give Ernie a round of applause. Thank you. For Q and A, we're going to come around with microphones. So please raise your hand, and, uh, and then everybody can hear your question. You red pictograph, ochre. Yeah, yeah. So red is red is ochre is a generic term for red mineral. Okay. And it, and it could be ground sandstone. It could be red pipestone. It's some sort of thing that's organically. It's red from iron, okay. and iron makes it red. And then you grind it up, and you you add something to bind it together, bear grease or something like that, and then you apply it to the wall. So, we're you're, we're using uh, like you said grease with the charcoal too to make it adhere. Probably we don't. There are techniques now where you can chemically analyze the pigment on rock art. We haven't done it in Wisconsin yet. In other places, they're, 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 they're able to do that. It looks like it's dominated by charcoal over the, the ochre. The black, the, yes, black drawings are much more common than red drawings, yes, yes, yep. in this part of the world. Other parts of the world, the boundary it's waters, red. it's red. Yep. Yep. Places in other, in Texas, lots of red paintings. So. Two up here. Here we go. Are the, uh, uh, the rock art in uh, the pictographs and ones that are painted, are they more uh, less labile than the ones in the southwest or is it the other way around? Are they, I'm sorry? Labile, in other words, they tend to, some of them are falling away. In so are they less stable? That, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we, we, yeah, it seems like the paintings deteriorate faster than the carvings. Um, and, and there's certain sites you can go to where you can just see very faint remnants of pigment and there's still pretty good carvings right next to them. Every once in a while they, they painted a carving. You get pigment in a, in a carving too. Uh, but in the southwest, things preserve in the southwest because it's dry. Right? It, it, it freezes and thaws but it's not moist. So the erosion in the southwest is just, you know, it's just, it's a dream world. Uh, and, and here it's really hard to find a rock because the driftless area, I'm working in the driftless area, that's where most of, 90 percent of the rock in Wisconsin is in the driftless area because that's where the most rock is exposed. Okay, uh, and and it's really hard to see rock art in the driftless area because it's forested. Yeah, but it wasn't forested in 150 years ago. It was oh. prairie, oak savanna. These shelters were wide open. These 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 glyphs were visible long ways away, the shelters are visible from a long ways. So the forest is a modern thing because we, we suppressed fires, prairie fires. Aren't, aren't you ever worried about these deep, low caves disintegrating, falling on you, getting trapped in there? Um, once. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it's Tainter Cave, you go into Tainter Cave, and there's, there's, in the first room, again, it's the size of this room. You go on your hands and knees and you can stand up. Um, and you can stand up because the ceiling has collapsed. So in the center of that room, there's, there are slabs of sandstone that are the size of a truck that have fallen from the ceiling. There's no art on the ceiling. It's a fresh surface. Underneath those collapsed rock, there's going to be rock art. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> You know, you never know when it's going to happen. Uh, but uh, I think there's two caves like that now that have these massive roof falls and no rock art above them, but all the way around them. So those have happened, you know, since they, they were doing the rock art. Um, and I suspect those are actually, those major collapses might be tied into some, some earthquakes that are happening far away. So the New Madrid earthquake, for example, on the Mississippi River, you know, you could feel it all the way up to Chicago. There's reports of feeling that. And it just doesn't take much shaking, I don't think, in some of these sandstone caves to get a little collapse. So I just don't want to be there when there's an earthquake. <laughs> there was another question here. Oh. Oh. I wondered about the, the red. Oh. You answered the oh, red, the red. red question. But now, how, what did they use to carve the Pictograph. Okay, so uh, she asked, what, the, what do you use to, what they use to carve the pictographs? Um, most of the carvings are pretty narrow lines, so they're about the, the width of a deer antler. Uh, and, and, uh, and at Gullickson's Glen, they're actually kind of narrower. It's, I don't know if it's a harder stone or whatever, but they, they probably use 
uh, just chips of stone. They make stone tools. They make sharp edged flakes. And they, uh, they were seemingly using those. Uh, Gullickson's Glen, the floor of Gullickson's Glen was executed at a war in Witchery in 1958. He executed the whole thing. Never wrote up a report. Um, but he describes finding some stones that are rounded as if they were used to make the carvings. But I think most of them were made by deer antlers, things like that, sharp stick. You know, it's pretty soft stone. The surface is hard. Once you break through the surface, it's really soft. Um, and so they're, I think they're, they're mostly finger width. Yeah. Modern graffiti, you go to most of these sites, names and dates are almost always done with steel tools like knives. And they're pretty narrow lines. You can, one of the ways you can distinguish graffiti from art is if it's a letter or a number, it's graffiti. If it's not, it could be Native American. If it's broad width, it's probably Native American. Uh, and if it's narrow, it's probably historic. But Gullickson's a little different. Okay. So how do you differentiate Native, you were just using the term Native American. Is that more modern? So I use Native American meaning indigenous people going back 13,000 years up till today. Right? They're still Native Americans. But, uh, but the rock art we're looking at uh, is almost all pre-contact. So uh, there are some sites like the Gacho Rock Shelter where you get, you get Native American glyphs that were done in the early historic period, probably during the French period. Uh, and because there's, there are symbols that st start to incorporate Catholic symbols, crosses and things like that on Native American art. Um, so, so there's some crossover, um, but most of the art we're looking at in that area is probably pre-1700, pre-contact, we call pre euro pre We're looking at late woodland? So, so the, he's asking if it's, if it's uh, the time with the effigy mound culture, which is late woodland, we call. So the, the culture sequence in, the, in, in Wisconsin starts 13,000 years ago. First people are Paleo-Indians, and there's 9,000 years of archaic people, and the woodland starts about 2,500 years ago. That's when they start freak at the first mounds of pottery and gardening. Late woodland is at the end of the woodland tradition. That's when they're building the effigy mounds, the animal-shaped mounds that were here in, right in this area and across southern Wisconsin. So some of the glyphs are clearly dating to the effigy mound period. Some are clearly dating to the Yoniota period the, because of the buffalo. The effigy mound ones are, are you know, the, the one was dated to the effigy mound period, AD 700. That's a late woodland date. And that, you know, the deer hunting scene is probably bow and arrow. Bow and arrow comes in 1300 AD. Yeah, 13, no, 1300 years ago. 1300 years ago, sorry. But no bow and arrow before that. So if you see a bow and arrow, it's got to be since 1,300 years ago, more recent than that. Before that, they're all using spears. Okay. But the vast majority of the art, we don't know. It could be woodland, archaic. Some of it could be Paleo-Indian. We don't know. Can't date the vast majority of it. Do you see similarities of any kind between uh, the Native American uh, rock art and some of the rock art that's been found in other locations like in Australia or like in uh, in northern Spain and in France? Um, so uh, there are certain styles that are Pan-American, Thunderbirds, and they're, they're represented in different kinds of things, but that's a widespread story. Native American mythology goes from Washington State to this area and out east as well. Underworld, underwater, the long-tailed underwater spirits like Mishu Pishu and Lake Superior, and you know those spirit beings, they're pretty widespread in North America. Uh, in terms of going back to France and Spain, I mean, those things were 35,000 years ago, and you see extinct animals being drawn there. You know, rhinos and lions, we don't see any of those in the United States here because people didn't, you know, none of the art dates back, those animals weren't here. Um, there are some abstract designs that are universal, that go around the world through time. And one of those is the vulva form, the diamond with a dot, or the oval with a dot or a line down the middle. Vulva form represents women. It represents fertility. It represents world renewal. It's a very common thing. They find them in the Paleolithic sites in France and in Spain, 35,000 years old. And we find them in Wisconsin, 1,000 years old. So all the sites except the Rocha Cree are not open to the public. Is, the, is there ever an opportunity where there's a guided tour or something where John Q. Public can go look at these yeah, in so, person? So if you want to see rock art, go to Rocha Cree. If you want to see other rock art sites, Danielle and I, through Driftless Pathways, we do offer tours to some of these sites. 
Uh, Tainter Caves closed off. It's in Gotchall Rock, so you can't get into it anymore. But we go to a place called Silver Mount. It has some rock art. It's in the book. And we take people on tours to Silver Mount to show them quarry pits where they got the stone and also the rock art that's there while we're doing that as well. So, yeah, we offer some rock art tours to some uh, select few sites. Uh, but, yes. So do you have to get, like, a permit from somebody to do that? Do the you landowner. The you landowner. Have to, so if it's public property, you have to get a permit from the public. But if it's, if it, you know, most of these rock art sites are on, pri on private property. So you just have to, yeah. They're not protected other than by the landowner. Working with the Oneota, I'm uh, working with the Ho-Chunk. Ho-Chunk, yeah. Have you been able to connect the Oneota culture to the Ho-Chunk? So, um, yes and no. So, uh, so Ho-Chunk is the, is the historic tribe that is still here today, and their, their ancestors go back to Oneota and Late Woodland and Hopewell and Archaic and Paleo. And there, there's a line there, but also the, lots of other tribes that as well came out of those roots. Um, so the Oneota culture... Uh, occupied at the end of at the end of the pre-French period, so from about 1200 A.D. to 1650 A.D., Oneida dominates the Upper Midwest. It goes from Lake Michigan to the Missouri River. There's Oneida villages in La Crosse, Lake Winnebago, up in Door County, down on the Missouri River, and you know through Iowa. And there's these clusters of Oneida villages. They're corn farmers and they're hunting buffalo and doing all sorts of other things as well. Um, out of the Oneida base. There are probably several good, several tribes that can make a, a good connection to them. One is the Ho Chunk, one's the Odo, one's the Iowa, Ponca, Missouri. So these Siouan, Degean, Degean Siouan speaker groups uh, probably come out of Oneida. Also the Miami Mite, which is Algonquian speaking or, or Iroquois speaking, and, and there's other groups as well. So Oneida, you can't say is a tribe, but it's, it's, the, it, it's the lots of tribes came out. The big problem with connecting tribes historically to archaeological things like the Oneota is that when the French came in, they introduced disease. And 90% of the Native American population died. And, and then the people who were left, they got together with other people, they intermarried, they moved, wars were, were you know, the Iroquois Wars, 1640 out east, pushed people all the way into Wisconsin, so the Sauk, excuse me, the Sauk and Fox, Potawatomi come around Lake Michigan to get away from the Iroquois into Wisconsin because Wisconsin's vacated because disease had hit it, the Iowa are long gone or leaving. Um, so it's just, it's a mess. And it's really, so the continuity is broken. And people stop making arrowheads, and, or stone arrowheads, and earthen pots. And as archaeologists, we define cultures based on stone tools and earthen pots and mounds and things like that. And, and, and as soon as the French get here, they start using iron tools and brass kettles and things like that. So, so, the, so the, an archaeological site in 1700 doesn't have only a pottery on it. It has brass kettles. 50 years before that, they were probably making only other pots. So there's, it's just really hard to make the bridge the gap. But we try. Out of all the caves that you've seen, have you seen any of the human hand with spitting ochre? Uh, no, no. Not so like in, like in, yeah, so uh, in, in Paleolithic France, they, yeah. they, 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 they replicated sort of a negative hand, but the they, they spit charcoal or, or ochre, and, and so you pull your hand away, and your hand is the negative, but the ink is there. I've never seen that in Wisconsin. Handprints aren't all that common. Trempolo has, has hands carved, and they're real big. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, you know, just haven't seen that in this area. Have you studied anything outside of Wisconsin? Have I? Yes. Uh, I looked at Minnesota once, but Have it, you it's... Seen, you should go to the Milk River in, Milk River in Alberta. Alberta, can't, yeah. So Battle I read... scenes with, with shields larger than a man. Yeah, yeah. Plains. And all lances, no, yeah, bear, no right. arrows. Yeah, so these are, these are old, on the plains, big shield warriors, and they decorated those shields, and, and so you get the head sticking out. Not like African tribes and, that we knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Ernie, you, you were talking about graffiti being plastered on a lot of these uh, paintings and other art. Is there anything that anybody's doing to help recover some of that? To recover some of the art, right? Well, so I, want, I mean, in terms of graffiti, right? So, so I mean, once graffiti is added, the art's pretty much obliterated underneath it. 
Okay, I mean the, the graffiti carves into the old art, so it, 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 you know, there's no way to take that away anymore. So all we can do is look at older photographs and document what it used to be. And so we're, the main thing we do right now is to find, we're trying to, we're trying to find as many sites as we can and document them. Because in a hundred years they may not be there. You know, or many of them may not be there. Or somebody's going to come in and carve the name of it. And it just takes one person. Gacho Rakshot, the stories in the book. It's amazing paintings, a thousand years old. Mississippian art in a rural cave in Wisconsin. People from the city of Cahokia came up to western Wisconsin. They went to this little cave and they painted this amazing scene. Uh, and and, uh, and, it, and it, was, it, was, it was so famous it made National Geographic. And the next winter, somebody went in with a mason saw and tried to cut out one of the figures to sell on the antiquities market. So, so it's, you know, you can't, you, you know, so the, the, the biggest protection thing we do is to, is to not advertise where the sites are. But that's, that's inspired the state to pass a law to make it uh, a felony or a misdemeanor. So there's a penalty. I can't remember what it is. Uh, it, to, da to intentionally damage rock on somebody else's property is, is now a crime. It wasn't before that. I mean, they never caught that person, but it, you know, it marred that site. So, yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Question. Uh, you mentioned Door County, uh, yes. Death's Door. Right. Is there a great similarity in what's there versus in the Driftless area? It's pretty different. Um, so, the, 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 I mean, Death's Door is on Lake Michigan, Green Bay, bo big bodies of water. We don't have those on, in, in the Driftless area. It's a completely different environmental world. You know, you're glaciated here, you've got lakes and streams. We don't have that in the Driftless area. We have rivers, and that's it. So, we got the big river, Mississippi, uh, but, but in Death's Door, you've got the canoes and the moose, and we just don't get those in the Driftless area. It's a northern. Uh, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. It, impossible to say. Question over here. Yes, sir. Um, uh, is there any indi or, uh, are there any uh, extinct animals printed on? Great uh, question. So, so yeah, are there any extinct animals? Because if there's extinct animals, it's going to be ten thousand years old. So that's why when the, in, in Tainter Cave, that one I thought might be a caribou, because the antler was, seemed was bent different from most of the deer and elk in the area. If that was a caribou, it'd be ten thousand years old. Because that's the last time you had caribou in that part of the world. Um, but it wasn't. It was 700 years old, so it's a deer or elk. Um, uh, but, so if you have uh, uh, an extinct animal like a mastodon or something like that, uh, it, it's going to be old. There's one site near southeastern Wisconsin called the, uh, oh, shoot. Uh, oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, Hanson, no, it's not Hanson, oh, shoot, oh, I can't remember, sorry. But um, it's right near Aztalan, and, it's, and it's, uh, it was excavated by uh, the archaeologist that ripped Jack, Stein, Jack Steinbrink from Ripon. Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a purple quartzite outcrop. And what he did is he went to the base of that outcrop, and he excavated it into the soil. And he found, because there's some rock are on the exposed rock, and, and, he, and he peeled away the soil, and the rock art continues underneath. And in some of the rock art down below, he found images of atlatls, which are spear throwers, and those are probably 5,000 years old. And he found a camel. So a camel is 10, 000, at least 10,000 years old. It could be 13,000 years old. That's the only one in Wisconsin. People have been looking for mastodon rock art across the United States for a long time. There may be two or three out there in, in the southwest. And there's, there may be some, a, a carved bone in Florida, a, a mastodon bone carved. But you can find an old bone and carve it today. So, but that's the only one in Wisconsin. Probably is that old. Do you think or have any evidence that the rate of deterioration of some of these is increasing? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. I mean, it, it depends on the individual situation. But Gullickson's Glen is just is just going fast, and and uh, part of that may be because of uh, I don't know if it's because. The forest has grown up, and, and there's more moisture. If, but before, when it was open, it might have been drier. The sun hit it more often, and it just didn't, it just didn't freeze the as hard, or there wasn't as much moisture in the rock when it froze. I don't know what happened, but in the last, you know, just in the last two decades, it's just really, last 30 years, it's gone. But I don't know why. I don't think it's acid rain, people say. It. Hensler, Hensler site, the Hens, thank you. The Hensler glyphs, uh, yeah. And there's, they, you, you can look on the internet and see that. Like Hensler Petroglyphs near Eustis, Wisconsin. 
We have time for more questions. Anybody have anything? Why do you think we don't find rock art in the limestone caves? Well, that's a, good, that's a really good question. Um, and the reason is because the sandstone caves are very comfortable. It's got a nice, dry, sandy floor. That's where people lived. If you go into a limestone cave, and I've crawled into a bunch of them, they're wet and damp, and the, rock, the floor is not level or flat. It's these tunnels, and sticking out of the tunnels are sharp pieces of chert. They're just not comfortable. Um, at the mouths of some of those caves, there's a little bit of stuff, but, but no, nobody seems to have gone into any of the limestone caves, and there's, there's hundreds of them on the landscape, and used them. Because I think the sandstone, it's just like you have a sandstone cave that's comfortable, and you get this thing that's like, it's wet anyway. It's clay and wet. It's just, they're just not comfortable. Well, I think we can wrap it up. Thank you, Ernie. This was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it.